knowing him, seeing him outside years from now, I mean, years, years ago, uh, he was a great father. I've always, we've always said that he was a good father. Um, maybe a terrible husband, but he, I know he loved, he loved his kids. He spent time with them, taught them some cool stuff. And all of a sudden he's not competent enough to face reality. I mean, he planned this, uh, according to the DAs, he planned this, um, really well for months, maybe years. Who knows? Uh, I think ever since they started having the arc, you know, marital issues, I think that's when he started planning this. Um, he loved her so much, he couldn't let her go, I guess. A, cr a crime of passion. But it's... it's Welcome back to Court TV Live. I'm Matt Johnson. In tonight for Michael Ayala. Thanks for being with us. Let's turn now to San Diego, California, where a husband and father is charged with the death of his wife, Maya Miliete. Her body has yet to be found. Larry Miliete is in court today for a mental competency hearing. Court TV affiliate KGTV explains what is happening in the case. Larry Miliete could find out if doctors think he is mentally fit to stand trial in the murder of his wife, Maya Miliete. Until then, the criminal case is on hold. Maya's sister says every delay makes the loss of Maya even more painful. We wish it can, you know, be done sooner. I mean, it's been a year and a half, you know, for, since my sister been missing. Larry is charged with killing his wife, even though her body has not been found. Maya hasn't been seen since early January of 2021. Larry has denied any involvement in her disappearance. Prosecutors believe he killed the mother of his three children because she wanted a divorce. The trial was supposed to start in June, but Larry's attorney raised doubt about his mental status. Maya's family says that came as a shock. Yeah, he seemed normal, like everything seemed normal for years until this happened. And all of a sudden, he's not capable of speaking or, you know, stepping into trial for something that he did. It's just, it seems like he's back paddling, and now he's trying to protect himself. And it's ridiculous to me. In spite of the charges, Maya's sister says seeing Larry in court doesn't get any easier. It was a family to us, you know, like 20 years you know, with the family. So it's really heartbreaking for me to see him. So where are we? What does this hearing even mean? Psychiatrists have to determine whether or not Miliete understands the nature against the charges against him. If doctors tell the court yes, then he is fit to stand trial and the case picks right back up where it left off. If psychiatrists say no, he's unfit to stand trial, then Miliete will be sent to a state hospital where he will undergo treatment to restore his competency. That could take months, even years. Miliete also gave a jailhouse interview with our affiliate KGTV last year about his missing wife. Let's listen to that together. When did you first notice that May was missing? Uh, Saturday morning. Okay. And tell uh, me. Her parents came by. Mm -hmm. Just tell me, kind of walk me through like the last time you saw her and what was going on. Uh, Thursday, Thursday night. Um, you know, like we got into a, a, a kind of an argument. Um, and, and, you know, we've been having, uh, you know, like problems, um, you know, for about a year. We've kind of like been up and down and stuff like that. But after that, you know, I give her space. So just tell me, so you got into an argument and then um, the last time you saw her was actually in the house? Yes, okay. Thursday. So she yeah. did, she, and she didn't take a vehicle? No. No, no one but, saw her leave? Um, no, but... On Friday, um, I could still hear, her, but I didn't physically see her when I got home. But that's like normal too, because we, you know, we have lots of bedrooms, it's a two-story house, and you know, we kind of like, well, I give her space. So, but that's why every time someone says um, Thursday, yes, it's physically, you know, or you know, visually see her, but um, for me, it's uh, Friday, Friday night. You know, I can hear her, like wrestling around making dinner for herself in another bedroom. I'm sleeping with the kids in another bedroom. Okay. So upstairs and she's downstairs kind of deal, like kind of like a roommate um, thing. It's okay. kind of like giving each other space. Well, sure. I, I don't need the space. She always wants the space. Got it. So yeah. it was like Friday and then you left or went went somewhere and then came back and she wasn't yeah. there, right? 
Yes, okay. uh, I left there with my two girls because they, you know, they um, uh, do their homes homeschool, mm-hmm. and then I just had my son with me. So uh, when I came back, she was still there on Friday. Um, we can hear her downstairs, you know, like after I'm done giving the kids baths and feeding them and everything. And um, on Saturday morning, uh, when her parents came came by, uh, her door was locked. Uh, I found the keys to the bedroom and I opened it and she was already gone. So I thought maybe she went to a morning sunrise hike, you know, because she, w- she didn't go jeeping because that's one of her other hobbies, uh, the jeep group. And, um, you know, she would have taken that. So assumed maybe one of her friends picked her up and, um, you know, they went hiking or the wine tasting. She likes to go wine tasting to Temecula. That's her other thing, or brunch, early morning. Yeah. After that, you know, like at night, we're like, okay, she hasn't come home yet, um, which is sometimes okay. You know, she'd go out maybe for drinks or something. Uh, she usually doesn't drink a lot, but recently she's been, you know, uh, doing that. You know, the latest she would be home, like 2.30 or, you know, 3.30 in the morning. After that, that's kind of like out of the, you know, ordinary. Sure. So um, my sister-in-law was recommending, hey, you know, maybe uh, we should call the cops now. I was like, well, I'll, I'll give her some time. Um, but we uh, initially got to the police report, you know, they're like, hey, you got to check the hospitals first. Mm. So this is like around 12 o'clock at night. And uh, it's like, okay, you know, they start checking the hospitals. Um, uh, 12.30, they finally filed the police report. And I was like, well, you know, maybe give her some time because I'd, I'd call like at 4.30 because, you know, give her some time if it's really, really out of the ordinary. Yeah, so after that, you know, they started the uh, investigation. Well, you know, three cops came, uh, I let them search the house. They looked all the houses, all the cars, you know, and then we'd just been waiting. And then I got uh, the NCIS called me and then he, you know, he was able to search the house and everything. Uh, my in-laws have been here the whole time. Uh, they start uh, doing the, the neighbors, you know, the cameras and everything, and trying to uh, figure out if when, when, when she left. You know, like, they can see it, but they can't really because it was nighttime kind of deal. Uh, we're just basically trying everything and anything, trying to, trying to find her. Well, Larry... Uh, he has done everything to try to find her. Okay. Still with us, criminal defense attorney and former prosecutor Eric Faddis. You're in Colorado. And then joining us from Los Angeles is Mitra Ahurian. You are also an entertainment attorney. Uh, Mitra, to you first. How does that interview impact the defense case? Well, first of all, anytime I see somebody who's a potential suspect give an interview, I'm thinking one of two things. They either think they're very, very, very innocent. You got to be really confident in that. Or they're trying to control the narrative and and they are narcissistic and think that people are going to believe that they're innocent. I'm listening to that and I'm just thinking, you know what, buddy, you're giving a lot of information that a prosecutor, you're giving a whole, whole slew of facts and stories and information that a prosecutor can really use to impeach you. And, you know, obviously no one's told him to keep his, his mouth quiet, um, at least in the beginning. So I'm also hearing somebody who's very aware of the circumstances and situation happening. So to jump from that to questioning his competency is something that really makes me think. I'm thinking about and I'm listening to exactly all of those details. Maybe she's off with the Jeep group. Maybe maybe she's just out drinking. You know, she's only a mom. She only hangs out at the house. But, you know, she's probably out drinking two, three in the morning. Um, maybe it gave him time to reach out to a certain group, according to prosecutors, the spellcasters. I'm going to get Eric's reaction on <laughs> about this on the other side. Larry was trying to hold on to May and he resorted to uh, contacting what are called spellcasters. I've never had a case where that was involved. These spellcasters would be asked to make May want to stay in the relationship. But as December of 2020 came, those messages to spellcasters were a lot more threatening. He was asking for May to become incapacitated, for May to be in an accident, to have broken bones so that she could stay at home, thus displaying his homicidal ideations to harm May. Eric, number one, have you ever had a case with spellcasters? 
Number two, will they be called to the stand? You know, it would be a first for me, but uh, I would welcome such a case. It sounds very intriguing. I've had hypnotists and, and a no number of other uh, people sort of of that ilk. But um, will they be called? Yeah, I think they absolutely should be if I'm the prosecution, because those are admissions by a party opponent. These are admissions that the defendant made that look terrible for him. You know, this is an alleged domestic violence murder. And those requests of the spellcasters scream of power and control. The, the, the two traits that are most prominent in, in, in domestic violence killings in my experience. It showed that Mr. Larry Milete was trying to control and manipulate and, and, and have power over May's life. And, and, and she was uh, not uh, excited about that and didn't want any part of that. And so that really provides potentially the motive here for the prosecution as well, that Larry could not control May in life so that he only had one other alternative, which was to control her in death. And if you may recall, you know, I know that you both have been on the program and we've covered this quite a bit, this particular case here on Court TV and interviewed the family. By the way, if you have any information, please reach out to San Diego Sheriff's or Police Department down there. But um, he didn't cooperate whatsoever. He didn't help look for her. Her body has yet to be discovered. Um, Mitra, when we're talking about the new news today in the fact that he is, you know, under this um, mental health evaluation, is that something that he can fake? Do you think that he could fake that he's not fit to stand trial? You know, all that's really happening here is he's in, he's delaying the inevitable. Like you said at the, you know, at the beginning, um, you know, this is a process of basically putting him, let's say the psychiatrists do somehow find that he's not competent. He doesn't understand the charges being brought against him. He can't assist in his defense. All that happens is he goes into a, a facility where they attempt to rehabilitate him in the sense that trying to get him to the point of competency. So we come right back to where we started. Um, I don't think think this is a situation where he's going to have a, a, a defense, um, a psychiatric defense. I think we're, we're it's really going to stop at this competency phase. But all he's really doing is delaying either by months or, you know, potentially a couple of years. OK, Eric, so pick up on that. Um, pull the curtain back for the viewers at home. How in-depth are these um, evaluations? Yeah, I'll tell you, Mitra is spot on. Um, but let's be clear, these evaluations are typically pretty thorough, um, that they are by psychiatric professionals, and they do try to determine if the defendant has what it takes to go to trial. Does he understand what's going on? Does he does he comprehend the charges? Is he able to materially aid in his own defense? And here, if I'm the prosecution, the first exhibit in the competency hearing is that call we just heard. Okay, that shows Mr. Miliete oriented to space, time, events, He's giving details. He's talking about his thought processes. Um, he, he's talking about his ex-wife's um, hobbies and everything else. He knows exactly what's going on. And so I think this is just really a measure to try and delay. And um, prosecution should probably be a little more firm in their resistance to that. Thank you both for explaining that. Um, and again, to our viewers, if you're just joining us, anyone with information, please, please, please reach out to San Diego County Sheriff's uh, the Family Deserves Answers.